everybody and welcome to another exciting edition of words images and worlds that's what i'm calling it dr low I, I think that i hope that works can i call you dr low can i call you david can i call you uh, let's go with david and all I right like, all right david. i love the title of your podcast it's it, i think it it covers what it needs to cover i try you know it's very fairy inspired uh, but then I've also got the images stuck in there. So I am talking with Dr. David Lowe. This is the academic episode is what we'll call it. We'll call it the first of many academic episodes to come into the podcast. Uh, and we, we I'm, I'll gladly share the video if you would like as well. I noticed you were just waving. So glad to share the video on the YouTube channel as well as the audio on the podcast. Uh, so you and I have a, a lot in common as far as things that we're interested in, things that we enjoy. You made a sketch when we were exchanging emails back and forth about today's talk. Was that a reference to Bizarro or was that a reference to something else? No. Um, you uh, know what? I, I don't know how um, how much it works to describe a cartoon, but um, so you're mm -hmm. Jason D. And so I drew a character wearing a Jason D name tag talking to someone else with a name tag that was uh, J F M A M J space J. And that's of course, because Jason D has to be an abbreviation for July, August, September, October, November, December. And so you were talking to someone who uh, was just the other half of the year. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. This I got yeah. that now. Yeah. Every time there's like some kind of a digital calendar where you can sign up for stuff. I don't know if it's doodle or something, but every time I see that, I'm like, Jason D. And yeah, yeah you take up half the calendar. That's right. And you know, the person with a bizarro type name who gets the other half. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I love it. I, yeah. I got that now. That's that's yeah. That's really clever. I like that. Th this is why you have the degrees, because you're like, here's. Before I had the degrees, I was a cartoonist, um, sort of struggling, you know, on, on like ten or twenty dollars per cartoon. Ah, okay. My 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 almost claim to fame is that I I nearly sold one to the New Yorker, but I gave up before we getting to that point because um, the editor at the time said we're not buying cartoons, we're buying cartoonists. So you need to show that. Not that you can generate brilliant material, but that you can do it 10 times a week for a few years. Uh, and I had no desire to do that. Oh, yeah, that sounds. I, I tried to get um, some poems published with The New Yorker, a story or two. It just never it never happened. But I have a nice collection of rejection slips from them. So that's good. Yeah, you could probably wallpaper a small bathroom if you've uh, been at it long enough. Just with yeah, the rejection for sure. slips. <laughs> For sure. So so you are a person who is interested in comics. I know this because I've cited a good bit of your work. And I should also mention you're at Fresno State Associate Professor. Is that right? That's all accurate. Yeah. I try. You know that Internet. It, it has stuff on it. So Everything on the Internet is true, I hear. Everything That's what I've heard. Yeah. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said that. Well, um, yeah, from Star Wars, that Abraham Lincoln, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's kind of the top of the Vita. But I know you've done several different studies, collaborations. You have a piece that was just in the reading teacher like. Yeah, that's with yeah. my uh, colleague here at Fresno State, Renee uh, Rodriguez Estacio. And we're really looking at how the comics medium is particularly well suited to telling stories about transition. Um and so we talk about transnational identities and transgender identity and, and how comics with that uh, presence, absence, presence sequencing, um, you know, which allows authors to then conceal things in the gutters. It's just a perfect medium for um, for liminality, you know, and, and, the, and the liminality that comes with adolescence in general. I, I don't know if we were able to get that across in 3,500 words, but it was a fun piece to write with yeah. a really wonderful colleague. And the, and the reading teachers, such a great venue, because I imagine a lot of a lot of people that listen to this are educators, will be educators. Um, there might be fellow academics out there and the occasional student that wanders on here. 
but mm-hmm. yeah, um, just, just a great journal. And, uh, I appreciate your work a great deal because you were also in, uh, well, not just for this reason, but you were also in an edited book or not book, but, um, issue that I did of study and scrutiny yeah, as well. Yeah. And thanks for, uh, <laughs> for your light hand as an editor on that, because you let us, you let us kind of take a freewheeling approach and include lots of images. I think that piece ended up being, um, 8,000 pages long. And mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, maybe not, but it was, it was about 50 or 60 pages. Um, and you know, not a lot of journals give you that much room to breathe. And I thought it was really fun to, to kind of make our point and then move on and make a different point. We took a sandbox approach. Uh, this was with Francisco Torres, uh, another one of my wonderful colleagues. He's at Kent State University. And we had just a lot of fun with that. So thanks for um, being okay with our peripatetic pacing. Oh, it was great. It was great. And thinking about the views that can be opened up through comics it, it, it was an amazing piece and we have francisco coming i say we it's me in this room uh there francisco's coming on as well uh, at some point over the summer um but that's also the nice thing about study and scrutiny and craig hill the one of the major editors there makes that case is that it's an online journal and so you can i mean you can publish pieces that are really extensive and and it's nice because a lot of times you find yourself trying to pare down and then it's like well what do I let go of in this piece so it came together really well really all 8,000 pages of it well thank you you were a great editor and obviously we don't know who the reviewers were but they they gave us some strong feedback that I think improved the piece as well so yeah, ab- absolutely shout out to the invisible labor behind the academic review process. Oh, yes, it, it is a process. Um, so I thought it would be fun, first of all, to ask you about, you know, from your from your look at comics and all of these um, <clears throat> analyses that you've done. The most or one of the most significant findings, something that has surprised you. Uh, maybe a recurring theme or maybe something you've seen just a few times as an outlier, either way, either direction you want to take with the question is fine. But just curious about that as a, as a potential starting point. And then we might play some devil's advocate. Oh, um, <laughs> I, if, if I had known, I would have gone to the Halloween box and pulled out my little plastic horns, but we'll just, you can insert those in post-production. Yeah. Absolutely. The special effects are incredible out here. Absolutely. I think you're working on a half a billion dollar budget for this. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just enough to buy all the Dasani <laughs> bottles that I want. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, a half a billion dollars. Um, so I think as a comic scholar, I've been doing this kind of work for about a decade. Um, and, and I always find new areas of interest to explore in this larger sandbox. One, I think, fruitful finding that I have made early on and keep coming back to is that there are just some pretty deep paradoxes that underpin um, work with comics. You know, one of those paradoxes is that when you look at the history of the medium and what people have done with it, there's a lot of really problematic stuff there. Um, You know, we find going back 100 years to the Sunday funnies, a lot of racist caricatures, sexist caricatures, those never went away. You know, they were part of the, I don't want to say it's part of the medium because it's not baked into the medium, but it's baked into what people have been doing with the medium for a really long time. And so you might walk away and say, well, gosh, comics are very problematic. But I think what the paradox is, is that comics is so visually present that it gives readers, and including very young readers, something to dig their teeth into as young critics. Mm-hmm. And then they saying like there's just something about the the very overt sexism in a lot of superhero comics or racism that that young children in particular children of color can critique they can name it they can talk about it it doesn't make them not love it they're critiquing something that they love in many cases and then oftentimes feel inspired to do better to restory to create new superheroes or to rewrite existing superheroes, to create fan fiction, or to cosplay with them, to do all sorts of kind of critical authorship with that. Um, I think another paradox is that because comics haven't been taken all that seriously, going back 
at least 60 years, um, a lot of young people can operationalize that and do pretty subversive work with the medium because they know that they fly below their teacher's radars. Um, so like doing work that might be otherwise unsanctioned or even fugitive, I'm talking from experience here. I had a group of kids in South Philly when I was doing my doctoral work who essentially told me we're not allowed to talk about race at school. We're not allowed to write about race. But mm -hmm. when they make comics, they were making comics about race because they kind of figured no one's looking all too closely at this. You know, they see us drawing and they let us draw. Um, and so they were, I had kids who were making comics about stop and frisk policing in their neighborhood. Um, kids that were, this was a Catholic school um, where talk about sexuality was fairly verboten. And I had kids who were, one kid made an extension to Raina Telgemeier's drama. She made drama part two, which I wrote about a little bit in the study and scrutiny piece. Um, she was doing work, you know, as a fourth grader, I think she was nine years old, that it wasn't sexy, it was about sexuality, it was exploring these characters, emerging sexuality, and doing that in a space where that kind of work was, um, was not sanctioned, and in fact was probably fugitive. So these are the kinds of paradoxes that I find really exciting in yeah. doing work with comics, because, you know, anything that's difficult to reconcile is interesting you know we're doing work that surprises us and i i like doing work when i start where i don't know where it's headed mm -hmm. you know to some degree that's any work with young people because they're you know they might take your uh your hypothesis and say no we're not doing that we're not going there mm -hmm. and so that's fruitful for me as a scholar it, it always fun always fun to work with young people to see the direction that it goes in. And I was just reflecting on a conversation earlier today. I was using Sam Wilson, Captain America and, and talking about that, just the first few opening pages. And I always like to dive in and take really close looks at, at some of those pieces and do of course the close reading stuff that you want to do, uh, yeah. but just talking through and noticing how characters are framed and then the larger kind of global conversations that you can have about the issues that are really baked into those texts. It's a uh, really good conversation, really good conversation. You've got the, uh, the Serpent Society and those early issues, right? That are sort mm -hmm. of cipher for the rise of, of neo-fascism and Nazism. And yeah, it really lets you sink your teeth in, doesn't it? Yeah. And then Steve Rogers in that and kind of his transformation from being an ally to Sam Wilson for a while to sort of like, what side is he playing on? And uh, all of those kind of pieces that come together with it. Yeah. No, oh, that's, that's great. I love that you're doing this work. With, I'm uh, having fun. I'm having fun. <laughs> I don't want to say with kids because they're, they're, are they 10th like graders, 11th graders? I forget. Mm -hmm. Yep. 10th and 11th grade. Yeah. Yep. So I, I see them as kids, but they don't see themselves as kids. So, you know, to use an emic term, I, I got to stop saying kids. <laughs> anybody under the age of 25 to me at a certain point i'm like a uh, young young adult kid kid uh yeah, uh, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> and i'm a kid at heart too so it's it's oh, yeah. hopefully not too demeaning um so you know we we have lots of conversations with people and, and we do writing that supports comics as this complex set of texts and textual possibilities so i thought it would be potentially fun as you as you take a sip and dive into this moment of some devil's advocate so i'm i'm going to play the part here of the devil the the person who comes in and says comics oh I've there you go it. i've got to try to <laughs> devil it's devil time all right um so my first question is but but really but really are are they books though uh, because one of the conversations I also had today passing a book around was uh, a student, kid, young adult, who said, but it's not a real book. And I said, well, it looks real to me. So uh, so are they are they real books? I mean, this, this is an ontological conversation, right? Like, mm -hmm. what's real? What's a book? We can really get into that. Um, I think, you know, if, we're, if we want to go there, then we just have to 
talk about the dismissive nature of that idea of just just superhero books or it's just a floppy comic it's just something that um is meant to be disposable saying mm-hmm. that sort of is making disposable the people who use these texts as the foundation of their literacy lives and you know i think folks like you and me are unwilling to do that you know when we base our understanding of literacy on a sociocultural view of meaning making and how people make meaning meaningfully then it makes it a lot harder to say well that doesn't matter that's not a real book that's not a real text I think it implies several things about what we talk about when we talk about literature, right? And um, it implies that there aren't valuable lessons to be learned in comics, in superhero comics, about strength and heroism and virtue and belonging, justice, identity, whose story matters, whose story is marginal, who gets to be a hero, who requires being saved by the hero, what, a, what does a villain look like? You know, these are actually really deep questions um, about text that we might answer in, in, any, immediate, in any media format, in, in any literary format. I think it's interesting that it was a young person who said that because it, it reminds me that we can sometimes adopt views that go against our own interests, right? In the in the interest, perhaps, of um, feeling older, feeling like you're on the side of power. Mm-hmm. Um, how would I want to answer that? So Mike Dando is one of my friends and colleagues in, in this kind of comics work, and you should have him on the podcast at some point in the future. And He's he on was... my list. He's on my okay, list. Good. Yep. <laughs> we were talking last week, and he reminded me of this essay that Umberto Eco had written on ur-fascism and, and how Eco had said, in this ur-fascist state, we have to define an enemy. And part of that definition is that the enemy is simultaneously both weak and strong. You know, we need to be able to say, you know, the enemy is nothing. You know, they can never topple this. But at the same time, use the enemy to ramp up all kinds of panic. Um, and so we were talking about how... When we talk, when, when we hear critics of comics, they they're not even real books. Mm-hmm. They're they're nothing. You know, they're these throwaway, you know, four color, ten cent menaces. Um, at the same time, we hear people talk about those are a great threat to children. Right? You you talked about Sam Wilson when that series launched. You know, Fox News had their segment about you know. Is woke is woke culture killing white Captain America and replacing him with Black Cat? Right, right. Um, with Clark Kent and Lois Lane's child, you know, is gay and is kissing a boy. Same thing. Fox News. Are they turning Superman gay? So it's this kind of ur fascism, right? They're both these throwaway things that we shouldn't even think about because they're not even real books, and they're also <laughs> a grave threat to America as we know it. And I think. Young people are growing up, obviously, in this media scape. Arguments, and so it's always interesting what side they're going to take. I'm I'm losing your your audio a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm not sure oh, why. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yeah. I think okay. I think so. When I was a young English teacher, I didn't assign comics. I didn't tell my students that comics were a legitimate literary form. This mm-hmm. was, I'm someone who had grown up reading comics and loving comics. And then I went and I got my English degree and I decided I needed to be a gatekeeper for the canon. It wasn't and until I actually left the English classroom and you know, went and got my master's degree and started thinking about multimodality and text youth culture that I realized was error in judgment. I had made, you know, I think I, I so desperately wanted to um, inherit some of the uh, of the academy. My eyes to the fact that young people were reading comics and including me were reading comics and finding value. So it's, it's a very easy slippery slope to find oneself on. I was on a similar journey because comics were my second year teaching there was something I saved for the end. 
you know yeah. um and i found myself very much in that traditional like oh i'm an english teacher we have to read the canonical text and we have to do those things and that's still something that you know i kind of balance out and negotiate of okay how much is how how much spark notes is too much you know um right. <laughs> and yeah how how far do you dive in and how do you make those connections and talk about that so yeah uh, it, it's an interesting dynamic of just the materials that you choose to look at and yeah. uh, the other thing you said there was the phrase justa when someone puts justa in front of something i mean mm-hmm. just a kid from west virginia you know just yeah. a kid from south philly or whatever it happens to be yeah it's um, yeah yeah um so next devil's advocate question you mentioned some superheroes there so th- these are just about superheroes right i mean when when you boil it down like i'm not into superheroes so um what what would you say to someone that sort of makes that claim about the medium yeah, well, I would start by saying that's factually inaccurate, right? I mean, this is a medium that's home to multiple genres. Mm-hmm. Um, and we could talk about some of those genres and the memoir and the graphic medicine and the graphic anthropology, um, the journalism, all of these genres. But I also would probably try to defend superhero comics too and say, my purpose for talking about all of the genres isn't to say that they're better um, mm-hmm. because I think we can learn quite a bit from superhero comics, including ones that readers might consider pretty fluffy because they still um, teach us all sorts of lessons about what does strength look like? What does justice look like? You know, what, what heroism and villainy look like? Um, in fact, sometimes it's even the quote unquote bad comics that might teach us the, the best lessons, but we can go in and look at a Fantastic Four comic from the 60s and look at that. Sue Storm is vacuuming up the the Baxter building after the Fantastic Four come in from their fight while the three male members of the team are kicking their feet up and watching TV. And that teaches us something as readers. It, it, it opens itself up to a very immediate critical read of the comic and as do the characters costumes as do their appearances on the page are they in the center are they at the margins i i think superhero comics really are are limitless in terms of the critical affordances they offer readers and so i I would try to get at that to someone who said aren't they just superheroes Mm -hmm. it's the justa again it's the justa and you know they're there's a lot there. There are a lot of lessons to be learned if we open ourselves up to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're coming to, I think we have time for one more question. And we can always do a part two of this. Okay. Um, so next question. Did, did I tell you about my son, Doug? Tell me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Doug will only read comics. I try to get him to read other stuff. You know, I'm a big romance novel fan myself devil's advocate here but doug only wants to read comics what 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 should i do for doug sincerely sleepless in seattle (laughs) so i guess it it probably needs a bit of clarification is the problem that doug is reading well is doug's reading uh events as a lack of diversity on his reading plate or is the problem that it's comics that doug is reading i never Mm -hmm. hear anyone say you know Doug only likes reading geometry textbooks, and that's a problem. Or Doug only likes reading uh, Victorian novels, and that's a problem. Which tells me that the issue is comics, not the lack of reading diversity. Um, I think I would listen to the parent. I would try to understand the concerns, because I think there's something real there, the concern for one's child. I would also try to probably get across that this is a kind of modal bias, Um, It buys into the idea that monomodal prose reading is somehow innately better for you than multimodal visual spatial reading. Um, There's really no reason to to think that other than we've been conditioned to think that. I think Mm -hmm. Frederick Wortham did a better job than even he knew he was doing in 1954 in poisoning people's um, opinions of the comics medium for decades and decades after. 
and he wasn't even going after them on a modal level, but that's what we've had now. You know, this idea that prose is better than, than image. Um, I think I would talk with a parent and invite them to focus on some of the strengths that a comics reader would develop in reading comics and engaging deeply with the medium. I mean, there's so many strengths in terms of inference making. You know, we have those gutters between panels and every time you go from panel one to panel two, you're filling in a blank and reading teachers know that inference making is important. We talk about visual literacy and how important it is for young people to be able to navigate an increasingly visual world. Well, comics help with that. Um, reading comics can help a reader reconcile a discordant meaning making system because the words on a comics page are temporal and the images are spatial and time and space are not the same thing. And so a comics reader is literally marrying two very different meaning making systems in real time together and still having fun doing it. That's kind of a superpower. It's pretty Absolutely. great. And this isn't to get into any of the critical affordances that we've already talked about. You know, being able to think about gender and race, um, I think in a much more embodied way than someone who's only encountering gender and race through a textual, you know, uh, prose format. Absolutely. Get enough time to get to another question. That was my goal. <laughs> uh, you you might have. Do you have one that you absolutely want to go after? Let's just go to the next one on the list. All right. Um, so, I mean, but aren't they, aren't they just kind of the candy of the reading diet? Have we kind of gone after that one, or do you want to talk about the power of comics for literacy? Let's do both. We'll we'll get them in there. So candy, I don't think so. Um, unless we're talking about that candy from Willy Wonka, that's a complete three course meal, you know. And oh, one, I like that. Mm -hmm. One little chewy piece of candy, because I mean, there's so much going on on just a single page of comics, as you kind of hinted at with the close reading. You know, you get the gutters, the margins, the layout, the composition, the line work, the colors all the off the page stuff that readers have to think about like continuity and character development and transmediated texts like the films and the cartoons and the toys and the backpacks and the food packaging. Um, if candy's a metaphor for simple and indulgent, I think it's, it doesn't work, but if it's just a, a metaphor for sweetness, then sure. Uh, comics are, are, you know, they're sweet like candy, but mm -hmm. they're complex. There's a lot going on there. You know, you're, you're going to have a, a turkey pot pie and a blueberry pie and it's not going to turn you into a literal blueberry like in the movie but <laughs> that's the metaphor i'm sticking with we're I going with that. going with the wonka gum here yeah unpacking the metaphor love yeah that. <laughs> um you're as far as power of comics for literacy um i think we're still surveying the margins you know it's like space it it's still expanding I don't think we found the sum power of comics for literacy yet. Um, to crib from our math colleagues, it may be asymptotic to, if not infinity, then you know some pretty big number. Um, right there. Yep. There's I was creating the visual for asymptotes right there. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, I mean, there's entire conversations and conferences that just focus on the reading processes, right? Where cognitive scientists and you know brain people are talking about what's happening in a reader's brain as they're moving from panel to panel. Then you get the sociocultural literacy people like me who aren't so concerned about what's going on in the brain, but are more interested in, in sort of what people are doing to communicate with other people. We've got the conversations about creating comics, which bring in the rec comp scholars and the art and graphic design folks. We've got the identity aspect and the cultural studies and ethnic studies. Um, I know Oswaldo Oyola talks about collecting axiomatic dissertation. I'm losing your audio again. I'm okay. not sure why. Sorry. Closer. You got the people talking about collection and curating. You get the library people. We get the people talking in terms of affinity groups and fan culture. Um, 
I think the sum of what comics can offer literacy understandings is is something that any one of us can't entirely fathom, which is why we, we have this growing community. And I'll end it there. I'm sorry that my audio was acting up. Oh, no, no, that's good. That that came through. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I would just say, wow, you, you said a lot in a short amount of time there, and I appreciate that. I appreciate um, the work you do in advocating for students and educators and techs and creators of techs, and thanks for spending some time talking about the complexity of this medium that uh, you and I both love. I, I've it was a little hard to step to the devil's advocate side, but yeah. uh, but I it try. It is, right? Because I don't think you actually believe any of those things, but you have to ask them because those questions come up all the time. They do. They do. So um, thank you, Dr. David Lowe, for participating in the academic edition, the first of many. We'll, we'll see about reaching out to some of your colleagues and uh, folks that connected yeah. with as well. So. Dr. DeHart, it was a pleasure, and I really appreciate the invitation. So keep on keeping on, and let's talk more soon. Sounds good, and we get we got a chapter, so that'll be good. We sure do. All right, let's start plugging it next time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Bye.